Hello, my name is Jess Smith and I'm a Scottish traveller. And I remember as a wee lassie, whilst on the road, sitting at campfires and listening to the travellers, especially the men, talk about the battles. Oh, they would talk about Sheriff Muir, they would talk about Dunkeld, they would talk about Bannockburn and Claude and Kirkcranky. And I loved listening to them, especially as I got a wee bit older and I began to understand a wee bit about what they were saying. But what made me feel that I was different from them, round the campfire, getting the atmosphere and everything, was the fact that I was never interested in Bonnie Dundee and his horse saddled up. I was never in, ever, ever interested in Robert de Bruce with his visor and all his, his sword and all his gear, or any of them. I was more interested in the people who saddled their horses, the people who forged the swords, who stretched the leather over the targes and hammered in the nails. I was more interested in these type of people the minions, the ants, because without them, there would be no battle. They were the ones that built everything. And then I would think of the women folk that would sit and they would sew the plaids. They would cut and sew the blue bonnets and stitch every single part of the uniforms for the soldiers and everything else for the Highlanders. There was just a world of people working towards any kind of battle. So that was what I was interested in. I was never ever interested in the big guy on the horse. And I remember once reading a poem. Actually, I have it, I'll read it to you. And it was written by a fellow called Lieutenant Colonel Cleland of the Argyle of Angus's regiment. Uh, he was actually killed at Dunkeld by a party of Highlanders and he penned this poem in 1678 about Highlanders and what he saw. And I, I like this poem because like myself it was the close, the closeness with the characters involved. But to describe them right surpasses, the art of mine parnasses lasses, their head, their neck, their legs and thighs are influenced by the skies. Without a clue to interrupt them, they need not strip them when they whip them, nor lose their doublets when they're hanged. If they be missed, it's sure they're ranged. But those who were the chief commanders, as such who wore their perny standards, who led the van and drove the rear, were right well mounted of their gear. With brogues and trues and perny prelates, with good blue bonnets on their heads, which on one side had a flip adorned with a tobacco pipe, with dirk and snap work and snuff mill, a bag which they with onions fill. And as strict observers say, a dope horn filled with thuscubae, a targe of timber, nails and hide, with a long two-handed sword, as goods the country can afford, had they not need of bulk and bounds who fight with all these arms at once. It's marvellous, in such weather, o'er hill and top they come together, how in such storms they come so far. Well, the reason is they're deemed with tar, which doth defend them heel and neck, just as it doth their sheep protect. But least ye doubt that this is true, they are the colour of tarry woo, tar wood, resin. So he, he's painting an image of the Highlander coming onwards towards him that he's seen several times. And the Highlander is, is blackish. They were quite scary. You know, their, their teeth showing through this black skin. 
Well, well, when you think about it, they were coming sometimes from far off. So they had to keep warm. The Kuri Dun was which the, the na another name, by the way, for the plague, would have been wrapped round about them. And they would have Kuri Dun at night, but taken the resin from the tar, the wood of the bark, they would rub it all over their cell, not just keeping their cell warm, but actually making themselves look quite fierce and big and strong. And these are the characters that I think about. And the, and the, the little details that I used to think about as a real lassie, a wee travelling lassie sitting at the campfire, whilst the moon was shining and the flames were jumping up around the tellers of these stories. And they were all great supporters of the Jacobites, the Highlanders, my people. A lot of them came from the West Coast, they were MacArthur's and MacDonald's, so indeed I think a lot of my ancestors would have been involved in many, many a battle. On the 27th of July in 1689, Viscount Dundee, or Bonnie Dundee, was mortally wounded at the Battle of Killicranke, or as it was better known by us travellers, the fight of Gilly Granke, or the place of the crackling broom. His sword and his dirk were removed. He was lying on the battlefield and nobody found his sword and his dirk. They were gone, stolen or whatever. had. They had disappeared. A hundred years later, his vault was broken into and his armour was removed. Now, the family history that I know of said that their master tinsmith forged the sword, the dirk and the armour and they managed to get away the sword and the dirk but they kept the armour open because they couldn't get it but they kept that particular line through the next several generations that Bonnie Dundee had never paid for his armour and his sword and his dirk. So they took it off from as he lay there, mortally wounded, on the battlefield. And a hundred years later, they broke into his vault at St Bride's, the little chapel where his body lay, and took back the armour. Now they weren't stealing anything. He never paid for his armour and it's superstitious for a person to go off the earth, of this wonderful earth, to die and leave behind debts. So the tinkers admonished him by removing his armour. And that's a story that has lived through time with the travellers. And I am sworn to secrecy, never to give you their names, so I will honour that. There was a, a William Sackerville, governor of the Isle of Man, I think that's how you pronounce his name. And he said they had a, a round targe on their backs, a blue bonnet on their heads, and in one hand a broadsword and a musket in the other. Perhaps no nation goes better armed. And I assure you, they will handle them with bravery and dexterity, especially with a sword and the targe, as our veteran regiments found to their cost at Killicranke. So that's, I like that, because that doesn't just talk about the Bonnie Dundee or, or Hugh Mackay or any of the, the great masters of the battle. It talks about the little people. And... Uh, and I, I, I always was, I had their backs. That I think they make up a story. Now, talking about stories, I would love to share a couple of stories with you. And these stories refer to the Jacobites, and they're two stories that come from the aftermath of the Battle of Culloden. Now, we all know what happened in Culloden. It was a massacre. It was the Jacobites, it was the, the hanging on to Scotland's ancient, ancient people where the Stuart line came from, going back to the doers of old. And they fought hard for it, they fought hard at several battles. And I, I, I feel sometimes they didn't get 
the right history written about them. And being part of the travelling community, I would hear many a story about them. So this story, these stories I'm going to share with you are from the travelling people. Now, the day after the Battle of Culloden, the Ramossi Moor was just covered in blood and dying and, and the, the people going around picking up bits and pieces among the dead and the dying. Relatives crying their eyes out, wailing with pain and sorrow, oh, oh no, oh, all over the place. It must have been tre absolutely dreadful. Now there was two wee travelling lasses because there was a campsite no more than a mile from the moor and they were coming past the moor when they heard moaning and crying and, and when they looked under this wind bush there was this young lad and he played, he was ripped and torn and he had great gashes in his face and his body was covered in wounds and they were surprised it was actually alive he just didn't look as if he'd survived he'd lost so much blood now, the chief had told them, the chief of the Tinker clan that they belonged to had warned them all, do not go near the moor, take nothing to do with the dead and the dying, just stay well away. It's all about survival now. Cumberland's men will be everywhere, saturating the land, looking for anything in the sound of a gale or anything that looked like a highlander. Stay well clear of the place. Close your eyes if you hear anything. Don't listen and go by. But these two lasses couldn't do it. They saw this poor lad. So they took off their shawls and, and they pulled them down to the campsite, avoiding the main heart of the campsite where the chief would have been in the fire and most of the people around about it. And they went down to the old Helix tent, the old woman. And when they took him in, she said, no, no, don't bring him in here, no, take him away, you know, you know, you, this is, this is not allowed. Oh, Granny, would you look at the state of this laddie, surely to goodness, you, 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 you can't, you wouldn't do this to a dog. It's nothing about dogs, it's got nothing to do with helping them, it's to do with the redcoats searching for them. Oh, please. Well, they managed to convince the old woman. And they got him washed and cleaned and onto her own bed, her horsehair mattress. And over the next three, four days, she cleaned his wounds and packed them with dried sphagnum moss. And she wiped his brow and washed them down and she gave him sips of broth or all kinds of mixtures that she and only she knew the benefit of. And no one knew he was there. The girl said nothing and the chief went about his business and nothing was said until in the middle of the night a scream came out of the Kyrgyz tent. The chief got up, he ran down, he looked through the tent door and he says to her, what's this? What's this lying here? He's not one of us. Is he off that moor? Is he a highlander? You have to get rid of him. Get rid of him. The boy was delirious. He was shaking on the bed, sweating with the fever. And she said, oh, she said, look at him there. Poor laddie. I've healed most of his wounds, but the wound in here, look, it, I can't heal that. Uh, uh, you know the red coats, if they get so much as a sniff of a highlander here, they will slaughter the entire campsite. You can't. It's not worth it. We can't take this chance. Please, woman, get him out of here. I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of him in the morning. I'll get rid of him in the morning. Come the morning, the chief was at her door and he says, get him dressed, get him away. For she'd taken the plaidy off him and she'd washed it. And it was lying behind her bed, drying off. He's, he's only a couple of days and I'll have that laddie sitting up just two days and then maybe another day and the strength will be in his legs. Get rid of him today. Please, please, son, she said. Just let me just try another day. I'll send lookouts. 
I'll send them north and south, I'll send them in every direction of that moor and if I hear one sound of a red coat's boots on the gravel, you will get him out of here. I will kill him myself. But it was quiet and the laddie healed. And he sat up on the bed and he began to move. Where's my father? Where's my brothers? Give me a sword, woman. Give me a sword. <laughs> Young man, calm down now. It's over. You choose to fight. And you've lost. And that's what battles are all about. You can't do a thing about them. You lost the battle. My name is John McPherson, old woman. I am the son of the Chief Macpherson. I have to have vengeance. My father and my brother are killed. Please, he said, give me a sword. Give me my plaidior. I will leave this place and I will seek vengeance. Ha! You wouldn't get the length of yourself, you stupid boy. Now just shush and I'll give you more soup. John Macpherson. Listen to the name well, because you won't hear it here among the tinkers. That afternoon the chief came. He sat beside him on the bed. I hear tell your name's John Macpherson, he says. Where are you from? I'm from Argyllshire. Well, Argyllshire's a far off way from here, boy. But the Ramossi Moor's up there. And there's many an enemy looking for anybody called Mac, whether it be McGregor, MacDonald, MacArthur, McPherson. So you better dump your name. Dump my name? Dump my name? Me? The chief's son? Give me a sword, he said, and point me in their direction. Look, laddie, he said. Come with me. Are you able to walk? Here, I've forged you, I've made you. A cromock. It's not all that good, he says, but it'll help you walk. I don't need that. Oh, yes, you will, he says, because you've been ill. The laddie stood up and right away his legs were wobbly. So he took the stick and he leaned on it. And the chief says, come on now, he says, come with me. Let's go for a wee walk up here. So they walk together up just a little bit of the bray. And as they got to the top of the bray, the laddie sat down on a rock. And the chief says to him, look at the heaven up there. Look, he says, look up there, Macpherson. He says, what am I looking at? He says, what am I looking at? What's that in the sky there? He says, the bird. Aye, he says, what, what kind of bird's that? He says, an eagle. Plenty eagles in our Aye, aye, he said. And, and what's it doing up there? It's hovering above its prey. Well, don't you know that? Aye, I know that, he says. Do you think for one minute, he says, that there's any man living in this earth that could hover like that, just stand over their prey with their arms reached out like that, way up in the sky, hovering over its prey? Do you know of a man that could do that? No, he says, that's what he does. What's his name then? He's just an eagle. Just an eagle? There's no man that has the strength in his arms like the eagle. Why has he not got a name? Well, he's just an eagle. Yes, and you're just a man. So why do you need a name? I am the chief's son. You're just a man. And you're a young, foolish one at that. Now he says, I want you to glance down there at the glen. He says, just run your eyes along the floor of the glen. Tell me what you see now, boy. He says, I see a herd of deer. He says, do you see the monarch standing above them over there? He says, on and among the rocks. I do, he said. Have you ever seen such strength? Do you see him at rotten when he has to take on bigger, stronger, mightier stags than himself and kill them or chase them off? so that he can continue to be the monarch of his glen, of his tribe. 
of his herd. Could you do that, John McPherson? It's a different, it's a different story. No, it's not. It's survival of the fittest. He has no name. He needs no name. He knows what he has to do. He knows what he does. Not necessary, John McPherson. Get out of your name. If the redcoats find you, they'll go for the name. Aye, well, you may say that, Chief, he says, of the Tinker clan here, he says, but we are different. We are men, but we too are different. And we have to be as our customs and our culture demand. Ach, away with your culture and your customs. Go on back, the Alkila's got some soup for you. That night, the fire was raging. John McPherson wandered up there. He pulled his plaidy over his shoulder and he stood in the darkness with the old woman that had nursed him sitting there by his side and the two lasses that had rescued him and the chief and other folks there. And they were all talking together when suddenly one of the Lukites come running in. The redcoats! The redcoats! They're coming up the road! They're coming up the road! Quick, quick! Get on with things! Immediately! The logistics of that clan set in motion. The lassies wrapped up the bairns, ran off into the heather. The old woman picked up their foodstuffs. They picked up this and they picked up that. They were going so fast that John McPherson couldn't even see what they were doing. But they were off methodically gone into the moor, leaving the old woman, the chief of the clan, John McPherson, the two lassies, and a laddie. It was dark. Darkness creates shadows. The flames were high in the heart of the fire. When up they come, near on a dozen of them, there may be more behind them, they couldn't tell. Led by a young, red-headed laddie, a sergeant he was, for he had three stripes on his red jacket. Hello then, he shouts. Is this you lot, you dirty thieving tinkers? You been stealing anything off the dead up there in the moor? Is there anybody here hiding among you? Oh, no, no, said the chieftain, sir. We wouldn't do that. We know our place. Who are you then? he said, pointing at John McPherson. Who are you? You don't look like one of them. What's your name? John McPherson felt the words. I am their chief son. And I seek revenge. He looked at the sword hanging by the young sergeant's side. He could see the others behind. Did he have enough strength to shout, I'm John McPherson, and grab them and kill one or two? Did he? But, wait a minute. It wasn't about him. It was about these babies that were hiding in the heather, these little ones. The lassies. The old lady, the older people, it was about them, it wasn't about him. But he was a Macpherson, he had his pride, he would die. But then he may be the cause of their death as well. So he said nothing, and he swallowed his pride in his name. I say, what's your name? said the young sergeant. You don't look like one of these to me. Suddenly, when it looked as if all was lost, the old woman rose up from her seat and she put her hands into her pocket and she pulled out some bits of bones and coloured stones and she said, young man, she said, stand back a bit now. I'm hearing voices in my head, stand back a bit. The young soldier looked quite scared. He stood back and she threw the bones and the stones at his feet. And she rummled them 
and she put her hand in her pocket and she took a little bit of flour and she threw it over the stones and, and it they created with the light of the fire like they were alive, like there was something happening there on the ground. And she said, oh boy, she said, look what I see here. Come, come here, look, do you see that? He, he never leaned down, he just, what am I looking at? What am I seeing? There is blood on your heel, boy. Blood on your heel. And it's soon to come across your body. Save yourself. Save yourself now and go down in that direction you came for and keep going. Before anybody could make a move, the young sergeant frozen look on his face stood back he looked at his men and he said fall in men come on down we go down we go and he didn't look back he was gone he was off and the men with him and the lookouts came back and said we've never seen redcoats go so fast what happened and the chief he took his clay pipe from his breast pocket and he put in some tobacco and he put it in his mouth and he took a wee light, a flint from the fire and he <coughs> puffed on it and said the magic, the magic of the old woman. What did you see, old woman? I saw the red hair, she said. Everybody who's got red hair, bonny though they may be, has a wee bit of the superstition in them. And him and his men standing here at a tinker site. <laughs> you know what they say about the tinkers, that we belong to the devil. Well, they would have been churchgoers. And they would have thought, oh, we're in this hellish place. And I just helped tease them on. <laughs> oh, John McPherson leaned down, he picked her up and he hugged her. And she says, oh, calm down, laddie, calm down. No, he said, you were amazing. You were, you saved us. And, and, and you never lifted a sword or, or, or you never lifted your voice in anger. You, you just, I just sent him on another journey, she said. You have to listen, John. You have to listen, but this is the last time, as I said, I'm not going to call you by your name again. And nobody knows what happened to those people. For their story ended. But travellers coming and going to campsites after them would stop a while and they would tell stories. Stories about Robin Hood characters covered in plaidies running through the moor, getting to people's wee cotter hussies before the redcoats did and helping them pack and getting them away to safety. They seemed to have a, a, a network of people who knew what the redcoats were going to do before they even knew themselves. They saved many, many lives. They just went by the name, the flame among the heather. And the stories that came from the flames among the heather were plentiful. And I've told you enough. So, you remember that one, I'm sure. Now the next story I promised to tell you about Culloden is the story that my mother told to me when I was 12 years of age at Garavan Sands. And she said, looking across at the water, she said, Lassie, did you know the story of Flora MacDonald? And I says, aye, mammy, I, I know the story of Flora very well from South Uist that saved Bonnie Prince Charlie. Aye, she said, that's the story. But there's another version of it. Or should I say, there's another person involved in it. I was just so eager. Oh, Mummy, said I, tell me the story then. Well, she said, 
it wasn't long after the redcoats were everywhere searching the land for the Highlanders or any sign of one Highlander in particular, Bonnie Prince Charlie. They say that Cluny Macpherson and his generals had, had whisked them off the Great Glen and hid them here and hid them there and hid them everywhere before he actually got away. Well, there was a knock at Robert MacDonald's door, the brother of Flora. And when he opened the door, reluctantly at first, because he was a Jacobite and he knew the Redcoats were on the island, and he opened the door and he looked out, and much, much to his surprise, there was several men there, and they were dressed in the plaidy and the blue bonnets. And one of them, one of them looked very, very, very royal. He opened the door, not taking his eyes off him for one minute, and said, come in. And he looked at other men and he said, is this who I think it is? Is this yourself? Is this you? <laughs> no, I. Well, if you mean Charles Edward Stuart, yes, I'm your prince. <gasps> oh, oh my goodness, he said. This is too dangerous. You shouldn't be here. This is not right. I an be he said. Clooney Macpherson stepped forward and he said, we have a plan, Robert MacDonald. We have a plan. We know your sister's up here with her father. We know that she's up from her education in London. She's here. And we want to dress the prince as a woman. Could you get her here? Could you get her to come? And she will know what to do. Robert MacDonald whistled out the wee low windy at the back of the house. And a young fella came down, he was only 12, 13 years of age at most, his name was James MacArthur. Aye, he said, what is it? Jamie MacArthur, go and get my sister and bring her here right now, fast as you can. Tell her nothing, just bring her here. Tell her she has to come. Off he went, running like the deer. And when he got to her father's house and he had heard, she heard from him what it was, she says, why have I to come? I have no to tell you. You've just to come and you better come quick. Well, in no time at all, she was running as fast as she could, keeping her petticoats and her skirt up to keep up with this young lad who was running across the heather like a deer. And when he got into the house and she saw these men, the Highlanders, and she saw her prince standing in the dark recess of the room. She lay upon the floor and she said, oh, no, no, she said. Why did you bring him here? He'll be killed. He'll be slaughtered. How could you do that? You have to get him to safety. He's our royal blood. Yes, calm down, Flora. We want him to be dressed as a woman. We've got lookouts. We've got a plan. Don't worry. Everything's in place. We just need to dress him as a woman. Have you got a dress? I, I came from London with the clothes I've got on my back here and, and, and my bed clothes. I, I have my cloak up, that's it. I have nothing. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but I haven't got a dress to dress you as a woman. Ah, said wee Jamie MacArthur, my cousin Jeannie, she's a seamstress in these parts and they say that if she took a seagull and cut off its wings and sewed them back on, it would fly away. That's how good she is with the needle and the thread. Will I go and fetch her? Oh, please, please, go, quick as you can. Off he went once again, young Jamie, running like the deer. And when he got to Mrs MacArthur's house, there she was with Jeannie, and the two of them were, were embracing each other, fearful. But Andrew, Jeannie's brother, was not coming home. He'd been on the battlefield. He'd been there with his cousins, many of MacArthur. They didn't know. No one brought back any news at all to the islands. You have to come to Robert MacDonald's house and bring your sewing box and be as fast as you can. I will not. You have to. I tell you, I'm not leaving my mother. She's, she's in a bad enough state. Here you go. No, you have to come right now. Who says? Robert MacDonald and Flora MacDonald. 
Robert and Flora? Uh, did, you, did they say why? No, but you have to bring your sewing box. Now hurry up. Well, she ran after him with her sewing box in her hand. And when they got into Robert's house, oh, when she saw them, and she saw her prince, she lay down beside him, and she kissed the toe of his shoe, and she said, Sire, your life's in danger. It's okay, he said. Fear not, lass. Now, they tell me you're good with a needle and thread. Could you make a dress for me? She looked him up and down and she said, Aye, I could do that. Well, could you do it before first light? It was getting dark. Night was coming. She said, let, let, Just wait a minute. And she opened up her wee sewing bag and she took out a measuring stick and she pulled it up and she measured him for the back of his head all the way down to his heel. And his hands and his arms and every bit of him. And she says, yes, yes, now, where's the cloth? Everybody looked at each other. This cloth? Where is it? And take a part of your plaidy, she said to Clooney Macpherson. I'll have the curtains off your windows, Robert. And have part of your cloak, Flora. Anybody that wants to give me a piece of material, would you just give it to me and I'll get the prince dressed as a woman? Well, she cut and she sewed and she cut and she measured and she cut and she sewed and by the sun's first light she had Bonnie Prince Charlie dressed as a woman. They decided to call her after an possible person, but an Irish maidservant to Flora, who could speak nothing but the Gaelic, in case they be stopped. And when he looked at himself, she'd even made a little skull cap for him, tied under his chin. Nobody from a distance would think for one minute he was a man. And off they went, down, to get the boat which was waiting with an oarsman in it. Will you come, Flora? Sire, I'll go with you, no matter where you want me to go. Safe, I thought. Safe, woman, together. Will you come, Jenny? Uh, uh, sire, three women's better than one. Would you come with us? She couldn't say no, not to him. Jamie said, I'll look after the young woman. Don't worry. And the history books tell you that Flora and Bonnie Prince Charlie got into that boat. But Jeannie MacArthur was there as well. And off they went. And they went from place to place until they got to Rasi. And they were watered and fed and rested in the boat that took them across the sky. Went away and they stood there on the braise of Portray, looking down, away down, at the harbour where the boat would be waiting to take him away. And just as they come to the top of the braise, oh no, what should they hear but the sound of redcoats, and they were full of the spoils of war. They had plundered and stolen, and they had bags packed high upon their shoulders. These were lowly paid men. This was wonderful bounty to them. And when they saw the three women at the top of the braes, they put down their bounty and they said, Highland wenches, boys, Highland wenches, let's go and see how friendly they can be. Charlie looked at Flora and he shook his head and he says, you two, you could run. You could run from here and hide. I'll wait. Oh, no, no, she said. Your Majesty, you can't do that. Can we not all run together? No, they would catch us. 
me with a long dress on. I'm not used to wearing dresses or fall over and trip myself up. But before the conversation could continue any more, we Jeannie MacArthur did something which is almost impossible for any human being to do. She sliced off a piece of her tongue. She bit it off and the blood spewed and oozed out of either side of her mouth. And she threw herself on the ground just as the redcoats were approaching and she had a pretend fit and she stared into Flora MacDonald's eyes as if to say, it's up to you now. And she began to violently have this fit and the blood was oozing out of her mouth. And when the soldiers saw this, what's this, they said. Flora lifted her hand in the air and she said, come no further. Oh, no, no, she said. She's having the Highland fit, don't you know? Can't you recognise it? Haven't you seen it? This is the fit of the Highland woman. And it's a disease. You can catch it, you know. So they got back. And they thought different of what they were going to do the three lassies. They never even looked at Bonnie Prince Charlie. They just turned around and picked up their bounty and made off. She had saved them. And when they got down to Portree and they were standing there on the beach and they could see an oarsman coming with the wee boat to take Bonnie Prince Charlie away, the large, large boat was waiting it would make its way down the shore and make its way out to France or into the sea. He looked at Flora and he said, Bonnie Flora, one day we may meet again and we will dance. We may dance in St. James's and a tear rolled down her cheek. And she said, oh sire, she said, can you know give me something of you? And he took a broken shell and then he picked up another one and he sliced off a piece, a curl of his hair and he gave it to her. And she put it into a locket which is still in existence in Fort William. And she kissed the hair and broke her heart. Now, Jeannie MacArthur, he said, I have been on many a battlefield and I have never seen such bravery. What you done for me, you done for Scotland. And for that, I will give you all that I have. And he took a little pouch out of his pocket and he gave her a gold coin. And he said, keep it, remember me by it, no matter how hungry you get. Always remember this adventure that we had, us three together. I shall never forget you, thank you. And he was gone. And when Jeannie got home, she was overjoyed for her brother Andrew was in the arms of his mother. And that night, she told them what had happened. When they broke bread, she said, Brother, I cannot now find love and get married and have children, but I shall work with the Sisters of Mercy among the lepers. And this coin I give to you, for you're young and you will go on you will forget Scotland's pain. Keep this coin in the family and never let it go. Pass it on to the next generation and let it be passed down onwards. And that is exactly what happened to that gold coin. Spanish de Bloom, I believe it was. It was passed down from Andrew to his son and he passed it to his son Andrew who passed it to his son Alexander 
and Alexander MacArthur passed it to his daughter, Margaret MacArthur. And she passed it to her daughter, Jeannie. And Jeannie passed it to her daughter. And on that day, when she told that story, Ganon and Sands, she gave the gold coin to me. Thank you for allowing me to bring my stories and my love of the Jacobites into your midst. Remember, it was never about the commanders. It was always about the little 